Oh, I must have turned it off after I turned it on. Thank you. So 6.30, we open the meeting and we said the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call. Commissioner Huggins. Here. Commissioner Devoins. Present. Commissioner Freiberger. Present. Commissioner Fatizi. Called in absent. And he is not online. Commissioner Jasper. Present. Commissioner Sexton. Present. Commissioner Frenette. Present. Did everyone have a chance to read the minutes from September 17th meeting? And do we have any comments about the minutes? These are, uh, these are Nicole's first minutes. So how'd she do? Maybe that's why we're so silent. We can't find anything. My, my only question was, you said that public hearing opened at 37 and closed at 7 out of 3, <laughs> but there was nobody in attendance, so I just wondered why it was open for over 20 minutes. So that one, we were trying to figure out what the best way to go about that one was because on record we did close the hearing at that time. Typically the, the way we would do it is open it. Is there anyone in attendance? No, then close it. But we opened it. Is there anyone in attendance? Went through our full discussion, then closed it. Because that's on record, we figured it would be best to put the official closing time on there, even though it kind of shows, it, it does read a little strangely. Okay. Is it best to not even open it if there's nobody here or up there? <coughs> it's best to still open it. So this is the correct way? Uh, yeah. Okay. So it takes a minute to go through the introduction and realize no one's here and close it. Best way to go about it, open, it the, open up the hearing, recognize that there's no one in attendance close the hearing just so that you go through the motion of saying yes we did provide an option for the public to make comment if they were present so okay and then staff report and then staff report yeah okay good thank you commissioner devoins for noticing that anything else looks pretty darn good can I get a motion then if no one, oh, unless you want to read it a little bit more? You always find something. <laughs> Good job. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of, oh, hang on here. Uh, September 17th. September 17th, 2024, as written. Uh, Commissioner Freiberger m makes a Motion to approve the minutes as written. Do I get a second? I second. Commissioner Jasper seconds that. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. It's unanimous at 634. We approve the minutes. Next up, general public comments. Now there is no, no one here and no one online, so there'll be no general public comments, unless you have something. We also did not receive any written comments. Okay, so at 6.34, we tried to open it, didn't work, so 6.34, it's closed. Okay, so uh, public hearings, there isn't any. We're going right through this meeting fast. Good thing, because you got a lot on the agenda. So unfinished business, first up, Proposed amendments to chapters 12.40 and 17.50 Cedro Willie Municipal Code to update tree standards. All right, so we have brought this one back to the Planning Commission a few times now. Um, in our discussion last month, there was a bit of concern about how the nuisance tree notification and abatement process would proceed. Um, and so we felt that it was best to include language in 12.40.130 in that subsection A at the very last sentence it says the city may abate the nuisance as outlined in 18.40 Cedar Woolley Municipal Code 
and the cost shall be assessed to the adjacent property owner. Um, if you had a chance to read through um, 18.40, I attached it to the uh, Planning Commission meeting packet. And that outlines the abatement process that code enforcement already follows. So we felt it would be unnecessary and perhaps um, it could um, create some discrepancy, discrepancies if we created a whole new notification for nuisance abatement process for uh, street trees um, on their own. So we decided to specifically um, specifically mention 18.40 Cedar Woolley Municipal Code and follow that process for nuisance abatement. That was the only change to street trees since the previous meeting. option for giving them notice and letting them remove it at their own expense prior to so yeah so I, I saw that those updates were in there as well great yeah Okay, so recommended actions, review the revisions to the proposed amendments, propose any suggested changes or recommend the amendments undergo a public hearing during the November 19th, 2024 Planning Commission meeting. So should we just keep it going here if anyone has more comments or? Yeah, unless anyone has any other discussion points. Make it clear we're we're ready to prepare or staff are ready to prepare for a public hearing at the next meeting. Okay. And then just as a reminder, there were some requested changes to um, title or chapter seventeen fifty for landscaping. Um, just wanted to reiterate that those changes will be a, a separate municipal code update. Okay. So, does anyone have any further comments, questions? I thought that that uh, ref referring to the uh, code enforcement uh, section, um, you know, pretty handily addressed what we had discussed at the last meeting. So, I'm good with it. Okay. Well. Um, do we make a motion here to approve it as is and recommend a public meeting then? Or do we have to close the discussion or what? I wouldn't approve anything yet. Just um, make a motion to... To go ahead with a public meeting? <laughs> task staff with preparing for a public hearing. Okay. And that would be a motion and a second and all that. Do we have a, a motion to recommend we move on to the public meeting next month on this topic? I motion that we move on to the public meeting for next month. Okay, Commissioner Sexton uh, makes a motion to have a public meeting on this next month. Do I have a second? I'll, I'll second it. Commissioner Huggins seconds that at 639. Oh, all in favor of going to a public meeting next month on the tree subject? Can I just Say clarify aye. that that's a public hearing? Pardon? Uh, can I just clarify that that's a public hearing? That's public hearing, public hearing, sorry. Public hearing next month. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? So that passes at 640. Moving on to the next topic. Unfinished business. Proposed amendments to Title 17 Cedar Woolley Municipal Code to update residential parking standards. Okay, Woody, I have a presentation for this one. There it is. Great, so this change to our residential parking standards is pretty broad. It covers all of the parking standards for all residential uses in Cedar Woolley. 
Um, and there's a lot of red lines on the attachment that I provided, a lot going on, so I thought it would be helpful to present this information in a, present, uh, a slide deck. So if you wanna move on to the second slide. The purpose for these um, updated residential parking standards is we've had both city council come to planning staff as well as concerned um, citizens that live in multifamily structures approach us and let us know that um, residential and visitor parking, particular, particularly for multifamily structures, is inadequate for the amount of vehicles that they are seeing park in their parking lot. Um, and one of these reasons that we speculate is that the cost of housing is rising, and in response, many households are choosing to move into smaller dwelling units to uh, be able to combat in this economy. Um, and um, one other thing that we wanted to well, so as I mentioned in the previous planning commission <coughs> meeting is Spokane, as well as many other cities in Washington and across the United States are eliminating parking standards or reducing parking standards or are in other, or just reducing the requirement for parking um, for m multiple reasons. One of those reasons is for increased land capacity to build affordable housing, um, to increase the supply of housing to bring down the overall cost down. And so that's um, one of the primary arguments for why we're um, why we're requiring a parking maximum for our pedestrian uh, areas to make sure that we don't um, find ourselves depending on automobiles and that we have a well-balanced uh, system of transportation. If you wanna move to the next slide. I did take a look at s about um, eight to 10 different cities in the region across four counties, Whatcom, Skagit, Snohomish, and Island. Um, these are the three cities closest to us and these are the parking standards for residential uses that they um, have. I do think that Mount Vernon reduced their single family residence duplex and townhome requirement. I'm not too sure about that. So these are the requirements that were outlined on July 12th, 2024. So it is a little outdated. Um, as you can see, most or all of the, these cities use decimals in one way or another. And Accordus uses a funny system, I'll say, that have a range and 1.6 to 2.5 is you know, you usually see an even half or an integer for the parking numbers. So that's um, one thing I wanted to point out is that Anacortes does do a range instead of setting a requirement. Um, if you wanna move to the next slide, Woody. So the overall changes to parking requirements, these changes are going to apply to all the residential um, uses that we have in the city. So when the, um, a minimum parking requirement is a fraction of a number, that number will be rounded up. Even if it's 9.25, even if it's yeah, 0.25 in any way, or 0.5 or 0.75, it's gonna be rounded up. We've also added a requirement for visitor parking for all residential uses, except for accessory dwelling units, single family residences, and duplexes. Um, and the amount of visitor parking is gonna be determined by each zone that those structures are located in. And we'll get to those requirements on the next slides. Um, I just wanna reiterate that there are no proposed changes for non-residential parking. This is only residential. Um, and instead of determining our parking requirements based off of just, okay, you have one dwelling unit, okay, you are required to have two parking spaces, we're gonna start requiring it based off of the dwelling unit type and the bedroom count so that we can better prescribe parking requirements for smaller dwelling units compared to larger dwelling units. Not every dwelling unit is gonna be adequately served by two parking spaces. <coughs> if you can move to the next slide, please. So this is gonna dive into chapter 17.36. This is gonna be off-street parking and loading. This is applicable currently in the R1, R5, and R7 zones, and part of this municipal code amendment will be um, requiring R15 to also comply with the parking standards in 17.36. Um, for R1, R5, R7, and R15, um, the visitor parking requirement will be one visitor parking stall per six resident parking stalls. So I would just wanna make it clear that this isn't per six residential units, it's parking stalls. So the amount of parking stalls could fluctuate. It's not gonna be based off the dwelling unit count. Um, and then as I mentioned, there are currently separate parking requirements for R15. Those will be eliminated, assuming that these municipal code amendments are approved and R15 will follow 17.36 now. Can you move to the next slide, please? So th this, is this is outlining the requirements in 17.36. You'll notice that um, ADUs, um, no changes to ADUs, no changes to duplexes with one or zero bedrooms. However, duplexes were increased to 
or du I'm sorry, duplexes with two or more bedrooms were increased to three parking stalls. We also increased townhomes, um, townhomes with one or fewer bedrooms is increased to 1.75, and townhomes with two or more bedrooms is increased to 2.5. And then in the other table, you'll see the um, required parking for apartments and single family residences. Um, just a reminder, single family residences are not required to provide visitor parking, um, but single family residences and apartments will now both be determined, their parking requirements will now both be determined based off of the amount of bedrooms in them. And so those are outlined in the table. Any questions on this table? I have a question. So we were saying you're going to round up if it's a decimal. Um, so on the old, for like townhomes, one or fewer bedrooms, it says the old op required off-street parking is two, but the new standard is 1.75. Why not just round it up to two? So the idea behind that is, um, let's say that we have four townhomes, because townhomes are usually built in sets like that. Mm -hmm. The requirement is, if we followed the old standards, would be eight dwelling units, and I can't do the math off the top of my head, but I think that's seven dwell uh, parking stalls now if we, with the new update. So it's just, we're slightly reducing that parking because we don't want to have that overexpansion of asphalt, asphalt. We don't want to have extensive impervious surfaces, but we still want to provide adequate parking. So the intent behind that was, um, it was a slight enough reduction that parking won't be eliminated, but we can still maybe save some ground in reducing the overall asphalt. So we're reducing asphalt, but the goal is to provide more parking. Correct. It's a tricky balance that we are trying to yeah. sort through. Okay. So in that example you just gave, would there be one park, one guest parking, or does that not count? So in the example I gave, with the new regulations, it would be seven parking stalls for four townhomes. Then um, with the new parking regulations, we would require one for six resident parking stalls, so that would be two. You would have one per six. One oh, per because six. the six, and then there's one extra, so that's yes. two spots. Okay, so it'd be nine altogether. Correct. Yep, got it. <coughs> when I read this, I had a hard time understanding half of a pocket space. I think I now understand if you have multiple townhomes, you multiply that by 1.75. And then round that number up. Exactly. Yeah, that's the intent moving forward, assuming this is approved. Thank you. Okay. We can, of course, answer plenty more questions later. Mm -hmm. But if you can move to the next slide, please. I think you went backward. Thank you. So um, this table is uh, diving into the mixed commercial zone as well as the transitional mixed commercial overlay zone. Um, there's very minor updates to this. We're just trying to increase parking for studios and two bedrooms. Um, there were no uh, changes to parking for commercial or industrial uses in those two zones, just for residential. And the visitor parking requirement would be the same. So the, require, uh, the updates in these two chapters are pretty minimal. Um, we're just trying to standardize a scale of parking based off of the bedroom count. Next slide, please. Okay, so the changes to the urban village mixed use overlay zone are gonna be slightly different. We did increase residential parking requirements and we added the same amount of visitor parking requirements as before, um, but we're also adding parking maximums. So if you have a resident, developers cannot exceed this parking maximum if they choose to do so um, in the future with their residential developments. And so the intent behind this is that a parking maximums encourage pedestrian scale urban design, which is outlined in the intent of the urban village mixed use overlay zone. Um, and the sub area plan for this zone does specifically state the, UMV, the UVMU will provide for more efficient use of resources providing for an integrated mixed use site plan to include walkability and reduce dependence on motorized vehicles. So that purpose is already outlined in our comprehensive plan that this is supposed to be a pedestrian scale zone. Next slide, please. So this table dives into the parking requirements for the UVMU. You'll notice the similar format to the previous tables, but now there's a third column in orange. That third orange column is gonna be your maximum parking. So parking for any of those dwelling unit types cannot exceed 
what is outlined in that orange column. Uh, the changes here match similarly to the previous um, to the previous requirements you've seen, but of course we can adjust these numbers as you see fit to better match. Yeah, to better match what you guys feel is the intent of the UVNU. I'll let you just take a second to read this, and then maybe we can dive into some questions for the UVNU. We, we have the same thing on our handout, right, or in our materials? Yes, it's in your packet. Okay. I can move on to the next slide if there are no questions. Yeah. Guest parking doesn't apply, right? There, um, there is visitor parking in the UVMU. I didn't include it on this table because there was already a lot of information on there, but it would be the standard um, one visitor parking stall per six, per six resident okay. parking stalls. Oh yeah, that was on there, yep. Okay, Woody, if you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, the central business district is gonna be the most complicated zone that we'll be working through for parking. So parking right now um, is currently separated into two different classes, I'll call them. So regardless, um, parking is only required for new construction in the CBD. Um, there is, there is a, we call it a historic zone, we've also called it a blue line district, but in this central business district there is a interior section that is outlined that is supposed to have more stringent regulations regarding historic character. It's supposed to be reduced parking in, in that area. It's, that's our old town, our historic area that we're trying to preserve. So that is gonna be what you'll see on the left. That is the reduced residential parking for mixed use structures with 11 or more residential units. If they have 10 or fewer residential units, currently they aren't required to provide parking. We, that is also on the table for discussion though if we want to pursue that. Yes. No, residential no, parking. Okay, no so parking is required, no, yeah. yes. On the right, you're gonna see on the exterior of this historic or blue line district that I'm mentioning. This is gonna be, um, on this exterior, multifamily use is permitted as a standalone use. However, there are, there is a limitation on between two and four dwelling units in that area. And so that is gonna be what we'll see on the right. So on the left, the reduced parking for mixed use structures in the interior of the historic district, we're gonna see no changes to the minimum parking requirement. We are gonna see the, a required um, addition uh, of visitor parking, and we are gonna see an addition of parking maximums to create that pedestrian scale um, urban design feel. For um, standalone structures, there's gonna be an increase to minimum parking requirements as well as the addition of a parking maximum and visitor parking requirements. One thing I do wanna note though, is on the interior historic district area, visitor parking is reduced. So it's one visitor parking spots, one visitor parking spot per 10 residential parking spots. So there's a, there's a, a smaller requirement there. And in the uh, exterior, it's the standard six that we've seen in the other zones. Next slide, please. All right, so here are the tables for those two zones. Once again, on the left is mixed use development in the interior. On the right is residential standalone on the exterior. There are uh, very minor changes um, in regards to the required amount of parking. Um, we're just kind of, uh, we're increase, doing a slight increase for the exterior section so that we have a, a sequence that's growing from 1.5 to uh, 2.53 to 4. But um, the biggest change in the CBD is going to be that um, requirement for residential parking. Okay. If you want to go to the next slide, Woody. 
Um, this is gonna be parking for residential uses in our industrial zone. We do permit residential use for work live units in the industrial zone. So that is where this is coming into effect. One very minor change, we're just increasing two bedroom to 2.5, as well as um, requiring visitor parking at the rate of one visitor stall per six resident parking stalls. Uh, once again, no changes for industrial parking. Next slide, please. So a general overview of the red lines in the uh, uh, attachment that you guys received is that residential parking is now determined based off the dwelling unit type as well as the bedroom count. Um, we have increased the parking for the majority of dwelling unit types. There were some slight reductions, as you guys saw. Um, we've added visitor parking requirements for all residential uses except ADUs, duplexes, and single family residences. Parking maximums are established for the UVMU and CDD as um, those uh, both of those zones have outlined in the, either the municipal code or the comprehensive plan that those are intended for pedestrian scale design and reduced dependency on automo automobiles. And lastly, no changes to parking outside of residential use. Next slide. <coughs> All right. Went through that a little fast. Nice presentation, though. Yeah, thank you, Ashton. That was great. Do we have any overarching questions to these changes? Um, Danielle. Um, so back up to 1736.30, which when I was looking at the code seems to not, I guess what I'm thinking of is maybe we need a little clarification because it seems like it's just, it's titled off street parking and loading and doesn't really specify commercial versus residential zoning, I guess. And so when the table was added into item C there, because it used to say all housing other than the above, two per dwelling unit, and now we have a table breaking it down. Um, this kind of how it read to me is that then you're looking at this except for um, I'm assuming this means residential zoned dwelling units. You see what I mean? Because then we go on and make the specifics in all those other zones, which are very different than what is here. So is that only confusing to me I, or? No, that, that makes sense to me now that you pointed out. I've just, I had always, I mean, this was how um, the code was written when I first joined. So I was just, that's how I'm used to seeing it written, but that does make sense. So maybe if we can just add uh, residential, all o other residential zoned uh, housing than the above or something like that. I, I'm open to suggestions on a better phrasing. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we can wordsmith it, but something along the lines of all housing in residential zones or all housing in these zones and list them out. And because otherwise, something you encounter a lot in codes like these is you read one part and if you don't know about the 15 other places that are different, then, and you stop here, you'd be like, oh, so I'm looking at my residence in the CBD or something like that and then thinking this applies when it does not because you have to go to the CBD for those specific um, regulations. Yeah, a very good point. Good catch. In that same section, <laughs> it says housing reserved for persons 60 years of age and older. Is there such a thing? There is. <laughs> um. <laughs> I've never seen it advertised that way. <laughs> I know that's not one of the changes. So I just yeah, see it. No, so I'm trying to I'm trying to think back because we've only had one senior housing type of development since I've been here for three years. So I'm trying to think if that one even applied because I'm thinking of Brickyard Park. Mm -hmm. They're a 55 plus, so technically doesn't fall into the 60 years of age older, and they were required to have they were done through a PRD. 
So they have two parking stalls for each unit. So I'm sure if someone wanted to do specifically senior housing for 60 years or older, then this one would apply. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But that's, um, yeah, that's something I haven't come across yet in my time here at Cedar Ring. Okay. Just a curiosity thing. Yeah. On, on that same note, I know it's a little bit um, beside the point, but item B, I was wondering how we specify in a group home, like specific bedrooms or whatever and who's using them <laughs> uh, I didn't think we got that detailed when it came to that it's not like you put a, a deed restriction saying one bedroom as far as I know yeah group homes we do have a very specific definition for that um, it's it's specific but also intentionally broad it's kind of a strange definition but it really it gets at you know um, the intent is to house people who need a little bit more supervisory care than the average adult would. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that kind of fall into that category. And so and we do have some specific regulation on parking for those and other things as well. But you know. It just seems that unless it was specifically written into the approval, which I guess is possible for a group home, once you've permitted it, even if they intended to have uh, one younger than 16 year old person in there, and then, you know, the, the other categories here, how would that, how would you police that? It just, I know we're not looking at that right now, but we might want to in the future, mm -hmm. if that's maybe overly specific and unenforceable. Ashton, I, I did have um, kind of a, a query. Are we going to, if, if the planning commission is largely okay with this um, as it's written and it goes to council, is it just kind of a see if it sticks sort of thing because council's direction was to increase and yet we are slightly reducing parking requirements on a couple of units? Um, as far as seeing whether it sticks or not, I'm not too sure. Um, that might be something I discussed with city council. Um, but yes, there are some slight reductions to the parking requirements for some dwelling units. Um, that is intended to make sure that the uh, required parking is a, a scale up for the bedroom count. So. There were some reductions to match that scale, as well as the parking maximums that I mentioned for the pedestrian intended zones. Okay, that makes sense to me now. I was kind of wondering why slight reduction, but explaining it as a scale then makes sense, so, okay. Yeah, and then the, those slight reductions were for um, dwelling unit types that are usually found in larger developments, so a larger mixed use building or apartment building or a, a row of town homes. And, the, the amount of units that are in there should require enough parking for that slight reduction to be offset, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have and I just wanna add too, I think by re or increasing the frequency when visitor stalls are required too will kind of help to offset that even though you are providing, for your smaller developments, you're providing less parking for the residents. It's enough for the residents there, but then you're kind of offsetting in the case that you do have maybe an excessively large family <laughs> for some reason, you still have a little bit of extra parking there too. Because I think the current standard is like one for eight units or something like that. It, yeah, it, the current, st current standards fluctuate between the zones. There's the most common one I've seen is one per six. I've also seen one per eight, and it's uh, units, not parking stalls, is that standard. Um, the, um, the, 
part about when the required amount of parking stalls for residential units is a fraction or a whole number, you know, yada, yada. Um, that's good and clarifying, but I think you have it in here about six or eight times. And I was just wondering, and that maybe that's necessary, but would it be better if you just had it at the beginning or something? In all cases, this is the deal or just, just a thought. If it's required to be in each segment, that's great. But. Yeah, my concern um, with including it in each different segment was each of these chapters, they, as Danielle was mentioning, we are outlining different parking requirements in each of those zones, and I just wanted to make sure that this one part of the requirements where we're rounding up is applicable in all of the zones. Okay. Or, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, also, in your slideshow, every once in a while, we'd see a handicap spot, and I don't see... Is that a different category um, of parking? Or? Yeah, um, parking or handicapped parking isn't addressed. The at least the requirements for handicapped parking aren't addressed in this update. But we do have those uh, established parking, uh, ADA accessible parkings in a separate section. I want to say 17.36.050. Oh, okay. It's, yeah, it's towards. That's the addressed end. somewhere else. Yeah. Okay. Um, could could we go over um, uh, you because you went through the slides so quickly? Could we go over the um, ADU part of it again? Because um, it looked like there was an exemption for for ADUs, and I'm a little concerned. D let me give me my, my concern, and then <laughs> and then you can uh, do it. But um, my concern is that uh, so we're turning R fives into R eighteens um, if everybody builds out, but we're reducing the parking requirement. And I mean, I've been in Seattle. For years, and just with uh, the uh, complying and non-complying ADUs that are in some of the places, like up on uh, Pill Hill, Capitol Hill, there, um, uh, it's it's dreadful trying to find parking in in places like that when I've gone to visit people there. And so I'm I'm wondering <laughs> why we're reducing. I mean, I understand why we're doing it, but but we're just creating a problem that has existed forever, and we have the chance to not make the same mistake, but we're setting ourselves up to make the same mistake for an idea that probably eventually will come true, but it may not be, it might be next year, but it might be 20 years from now when people get out of their cars and uh, and, uh, and and don't drive them uh, everywhere. And so, um, again, I, I was just curious about the, the, how the how that was structured for the ADUs and the R5 and R7 zones. Yeah, a very good point. So uh, current requirements for ADUs is one parking stall per ADU. Um, there, I'm not proposing a reduction from that one to zero parking stalls. Um, the exemption that you were talking about is they are exempt from um, re supplying visitor parking. Oh. So there's no need for visitor parking for ADUs. Um, as you know, though, the state legislature now says we need two ADUs. So we could look at um, increasing the uh, ADU parking requirement to, say, 2.5 or even 3 for two ADUs, or however that we want to do that. But as of right now in this amendment, it is one parking stall per ADU. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I might make a suggestion here. Um, behind the scenes, we've been working on a draft of an ADU ordinance to get us in compliance with the state requirements. Um, and I remember we had taken a look at the parking requirement for ADUs as well. And there was some stipulation that our legal counsel did recommend to put in there that if you are within 100 feet, I think, of a transit stop, that you are not required to uh, put parking. That was a requirement of the state? One half mile. One half mile. Um, but yes, yes. So I might suggest we take we strike ADUs from this table if we're going to be changing the ADU chapter to include parking regulations specific to them. So, so you're saying do a separate thing for a separate chapter? For Since ADUs we have an ADU them. chapter already and that contains its own specific regulations, I think it might... I mean, maybe we make a reference to ADU parking regulations are found in this chapter or however that needs to look. But I think having everything for ADUs in one place does kind of make sense since we do it for the other chapters, CBD, UVMU. 
So then what that would mean is that uh, chapter 1736 would only address uh, the residential zones for single family, townhouse, duplex, but ADUs, you'd have to go to the ADU chapter. Is that? Yeah, and we don't, instead of striking it through on this table, I can put um, parking requirements for ADUs are found in 17.100 or. I, sorry, I, I feel like, I feel like it should be in both places if you're gonna do that because um, there are a lot of things that we deal with where it would be nice to have, you know, like fees. Fees are all in the fee section, right? And then they're referred to when you're in the other thing. And I don't care if they're also in the section, other sections for things, but, um, but it'd be nice to have everything in a table right there that you can grab and it's got everything. It, same with the parking. It'd be nice to have like you have here in your presentation where all that stuff's right there and you can just look at it and say, oh, I'm in R7, so this is gonna be what I'm gonna be doing, or I'm in the CBD, this is what I'm gonna be doing. But if you also wanted to reference it in the, in the chapters on, um, on the things, I think that's fine too. I mean, it just, you just have to make sure that when you change it in one place, it, exactly. it's changed they gotta in both, say the same both thing. places, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, I don't like, I never liked codes, that's why I didn't license as an ar architect. I did a lot of design and building, but I, uh, but I never licensed because I hate codes. Um, and the reason I hate codes is because you are all over the book when you are reading codes. You know, you're here, and then you're jumping over here, and then you're doing that. And the more you can have it in one place, uh, the easier uh, it is. So at the very least, have it in, in both places. So just, just my recommendation. Yeah, really the only qualm I have with having it in two places is that future staff will need to remember, oh yeah, it's also in that other chapter, and say we make an update to this one, forget the other one, that we have two yeah. non-coinciding uh, <laughs> um, regulations. So. But like Ashton said, if you have um, a reference to the other spot, mm -hmm. that helps. One thing we could do as part of this update is just create a separate table that we can put on our planning department documents website. It won't be put into the code or anything, but a table that just outlines all these requirements, maybe have the zone at the top, and then you have the dwelling unit type on the column. Mm -hmm. And we can outline it that way, and that way it's, we, we can have everything in one place, but it's still separated by zoning type in the code. Yeah, okay, yeah. So that would basically be kind of a helpful handout then, but not codified in that way. If for some reason it didn't get updated, it would still be, we'd still have the fallback of the code. Is that, am I correct? Correct. Okay. In that situation, the code would be the binding okay. regulation. Yeah, the controlling. Okay. Uh, that's something that I've always liked doing within our applications. Um, is also in addition to our checklist of submittal requirements, you go through your procedure for permitting and you also go through your, you know, highlights from the code of what's gonna be required to show on your plans, that sort of thing. So that's something we, we like to put together on our applications just to make it very clear to the applicant what's gonna be expected of them. That can be another place, helpful hints, but. Are parking space requirements spelled out somewhere in another chapter? Like what size they're supposed to be, how much room between them and all that? Um, so parking space requirements or parking space dimensions, well for one I'll say compact parking stall dimensions are outlined in the municipal code in a separate section. For non-compact parking stall dimensions, there is an ordinance from the 80s that I've seen our interim city engineer refer to I've also seen our engineering department refer to the, I, th I think the Department of Transportation's like highways <coughs> division at the federal level. We've referred to their guiding documents. But um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, we don't have dimensions for standard parking stalls codified in our code. Do you think there should be a reference to that? Personally, I do. Because they could make up their own dimensions. We do review the parking stall dimensions and we do require nine, by, nine feet width by 19 foot length, but um, that is a point of contention. Good phrase. Uh oh, did I hit a something there, nerve? 
and then space between them. So when you're when you're backing up, you don't run into the guy behind you. Uh, yeah, you do need to be very very particular about what counts as your 19 foot length. Because is that from the curb? Is that from your curb stop? You know, it it tends to get pretty wild. And uh, when you're talking about your drive lane width, so. We just had this the other day doing plan review where there was proposed 18 foot stalls. They had taken that measurement from the curb and not the curb stop. So technically, in my opinion, that's a 16 foot long stall. But then I'm looking at their drive lane, which is 26 feet wide and the requirement minimum is 24. So I'm like, technically it works <laughs> because <laughs> they're not gonna be sticking out and impeding the drive lane. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. These things need to be very, very, very clear and concise in one spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think it's something that we should codify in our code, um, but I would want to consult with our engineering department about where that would be and what they would want to see in that code as well. Yeah. And you also want to look at, um, probably it's an online version now, but Ramsey and Sleeper is what architects use. So if somebody's designing, they they go to a, they don't go to the engineering handbook they go to the architectural handbook which is uh, Ramsey and Sleeper and so um, so you want to include what they have or at least look at what they have when you're designing them so this probably doesn't have anything to do with code but the other day I was helping somebody move from an apartment over on uh, what do you call that anyway in in town and uh, there's no place to help people move. There's no loading zone or anything. And you have to just hope that someone's not gonna be there so you can take their spot. So it's probably nothing that we can do about that, but I guess the more guest spots you have, the better you can take up those spots. It's smart though, like having a loading zone mm -hmm. for yeah. like moving vans. Mm -hmm. The people come and go. If we were to consider requiring a loading zone for residential uses, would we set a threshold like a minimum dwelling unit count or mm -hmm. some sort of, just something to think about how, when that would I'm require. I'm hoisting it up the flagpole for a discussion. It's a great point. Yeah, because yeah, we're creating, with our parking regulations, if we do what we're doing, we're, we're, we're making our parking situation in our city more urban. So we need to think of the urban things and that's one of them is, is where, where do you do that? So it's a great, uh, yeah, great point. Like your Amazon trucks and stuff. That exactly, they're coming and going all day. Yeah. 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 It, thinking on Amazon trucks and that sort of thing, I think our required fire department turn around turnarounds and emergency access do well in accommodating for at least them to be able to get themselves turned around and get to the house as they need to. Multi-family, but yeah, I'm thinking on, on loading zones. I feel like you'd be eating into that pedestrian zone, right? We're trying to, you're, you want to limit the asphalt and that's a big, that's a big parking stall. It is. But it also makes sense to have, like for a, a large apartment unit. So maybe, yeah, so it, it, maybe it should be based on density of the apartment building. I'm thinking locationally too, you know, if, if we're gonna require one for each building and at what unit count does that um, apply and that sort of thing. I'm just thinking, might be a good in idea your example, in theory, but you not know, in practicality. <laughs> trying to get someone moved in, you're gonna want it close to the door and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So if you have just you know one loading zone central, that's not gonna work for everybody. I'm, I'm thinking that <laughs> the city may have a different view on it, but, um, but I think just, um, I, I've talked to quite a few Amazon and um, UPS and those kind of drivers, and uh, uh, I live up on Alderwood Lane, and they, they come up and they use the end of my cul-de-sac because they, they're there every day, and they're there at the same time every day delivering to people. They, they're basically like postmen now, they, they run routes, and they use the end of Alderwood Lane because it's quiet up there, and there's no restriction, you know, it's just a, it's just a cul-de-sac, there's no, there's only three driveways off of it, and um, and there's no restrictions. So they come up there. Sometimes they eat lunch there. Sometimes they just repack their trucks there. You know, re remove things around so they can get to the next phase of their delivery. But the point I was going to make was that um, I can I could see where 
that would be stressful for them to be out and you have no place that's officially set up for you to, to park, but they could easily use fire lanes, like you're saying, as, um, as where they do their unload, because they're just loading and unloading and then they're out of there. And the same with um, moving trucks could use fire lanes too, but they're probably terrified. I mean, they probably do it, but you're, it's like double parking, you know, you're terrified that you're gonna get caught or get a ticket or something for doing that. So um, I know, is there any way that that they can be used as fire lanes because the fire department only needs them when there's fire. The rest of the time they're sitting empty. Can those be delivery zones uh, under the understanding that you got to move it if uh, <laughs> and quickly if, uh, if you know something happens? Uh, just a thought. Um, I know at the marina in La Conner, um, they have signs at various spots, the closest ones to the gates that say 30 minute unload and load only. And generally speaking, nobody parks there unless they're loading and unloading. So maybe that's up to the builder to decide to do that or not, but that's, if they're labeled properly, nobody feels guilty about pulling in there and leaving. Is that example on street parking or off street? Parking? That would be off street. Or on street, depends on where the, the place is located, I guess. This may be uh, an ignorant question, but it's very different for commercial. Isn't a loading spot usually required for commercial? Uh, we require that, correct? And uh, yes, for warehousing, storage, usually it does come into play with industrial type uses. And then do you happen to know the dimensions then of a loading spot versus? Not off the top okay. of my head, I'm sorry. But <laughs> no, that, that's okay, I was trying to Google it here and <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, just because I'm thinking, I live in an apartment complex that has multiple buildings and our neighbor was moving and they had their moving truck you know, parked in one of the, the regular stalls and it, it wasn't a real long one, so it, it stuck out in the street a, a bit and everybody just kind of drove around it and stuff. And when Amazon or, or you know, UPS or whatever, if they can't find a spot, they'll just kind of like park. Uh, there have been once or twice where I was like, I have to go somewhere and I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get out and I hope I can track down whoever parked here. But um, for the most part, I think if we're thinking especially if a loading spot is dimensionally a lot bigger than a regular parking spot, it would be, as was mentioned, very difficult to provide that for every building in a place that would actually work for people anyway. They're, they're gonna park wherever it's closest because they don't wanna have to haul their furniture, you know, halfway down the block. So even if like our, our building is directly across from the management office, which has parking in front of it that's designated for that. And so almost nobody ever parks there unless they have business there. And so theoretically you could use that if you're trying to load or unload, but people don't because it's across the way and you'd have to walk all the way across. So yeah, I think, I think there would, it would be take, taking up a lot of space and probably not actually solve the problem. It'd probably have to be a big complex to come in handy, so. Just more like a hotel. Speaking of hotels, we have a brand new hotel on Trail Road. Does that apply to anything? That's that's their own game. <laughs> oh, wait, does it apply to? Does that parking doesn't matter there? Oh, they have. Um, it's under the building. A what? It's under the building. Under the building. Yeah. Oh. It's our first under the building parking. It, it's not underground. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's like. The first floor? Covered, yeah, covered, covered by parking. the second floor. Okay. Hmm. It's hard to see, but it's there. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So what do they have, one spot for every room? One. 
I believe so. Is something like that covered in code? Yes, hotels are a commercial type use, mm -hmm. and that's a, a separate issue than, than this is, um, since we're not touching commercial parking. Mm -hmm. Commissioner DeVoynes. And maybe off topic, I apologize, but <coughs> as I read the intent for the 17.24.050, um, I'm sorry, I don't understand what it said. It said the, the city is authorized to collect in the parking fees. I don't know what in the parking fees are, but it's saying that if I have a residence in the Central Fifteen District, I have to pay a part of my own residence. residence <coughs> sorry. <coughs> if I have a residence in the Central District District, Do I need to pay the park in my own park, park of mine? I guess I don't know what any of the parking fees are. I'm reading the intent um, chapter 17.24.050. Yeah, I, I see what you're calling out here, and this is interesting. Um. Do I have to pay to park in my own parking spot? I, I can't hear you. What is the oh, in lieu of parking lieu fees? Of parking. Oops, sorry. Were those six eight? So, the way I read this is if someone is trying to do new construction in the downtown, most of the lots in the downtown are very small. Um, and so, creating parking in the ways that we've prescribed in the code can sometimes kill someone's project. So this allows them an option to pay the city. Instead of providing parking on their site, they would pay a certain amount specified by the city so that the city can come and invest in a public uh, parking lot, essentially. So um, where we do the Logarodeo carvings would be an example of that. Um, and there's one behind the old Wells Fargo Bank as well on the south side, both city-owned parking lots. Does the city own that wood carving lot? Yes. Oh, nice. Thank you. I read that over and over and I can understand what that meant. Would it be correct to say, though, that we really, we have that language in there as kind of a out, but we don't really have anything in place. Like if somebody came in tomorrow and had this proposal, we don't have a fund, do we, that you can pay into for a lot? Um, because I mean, the two lots you talked about, I mean, the Lager Rodeo one, I mean, it, I don't know how often it's used for events, but, um, you know. Once a year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. I mean, I guess, I don't know how that would work for. It's, it's half full every weekend because of Joy's Bakery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not quite sure what the finance mechanism is. I've actually never dealt with that once in my time either, but. Um, I don't think anybody has. Yeah, there have been other other things that have come up. For example, we, we do offer um, a fee in lieu of providing open space within a subdivision if, what is it, 
Um, if your subdivision is 15 lots or less, you can pay, I think it's $15,000 to the parks uh, fund so that the city can use that to um, enhance or maintain its city parks. So we have things like that throughout the code, but I've never seen this used. <laughs> So I don't know how it works, but yeah, both of those parking lots date back to the to the '60s. Mm -hmm. um, they were within a year or two of each other. But I know the the one there behind Joy's Bakery uh, by the Cedarly Auto Parts that 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 one was when the when the old dry cleaner burned down and the city, I guess, just bought the lot and and turned it into parking. So um, yeah, so there hasn't been a need or hasn't been an opportunity to raise enough money to buy <laughs> a piece of land and, and stripe it. So. Yeah, it, and frankly, we, we don't have too many um, un, undeveloped lots in the CBD. The only ones I can think of, well, we've got the, the old video store that burnt down. That's a vacant lot. And then there's one on State Street it's relatively small, and it's also got a very strange easement situation, so nobody's wanted to touch it. Um, yeah, the only places I can think of are, are along the railroad tracks there at the end of Woodworth, and um, and maybe the, the old Vern Sims lots would be places where you could do more parking if you wanted to, but it's yeah. quite a walk to the main street from there. I'm not familiar with Vern, Vern Sims. Uh, that's Is that that's the, the north, north side of Ferry... Uh, on the west side of the tracks. By the antique store there? No, um, between the railroad tracks and the Chevron at the end of, at the end of Ferry, where it hooks up there by um, uh, Food Pavilion. Got it. The uh, car dealership? Yeah, the old car dealership. Oh, yeah, Ford or whatever it was. Yeah. And then also the vacated railroad tracks, everybody parks there for big events, mm -hmm. which is almost a parking lot now. Yeah. It'd be an easy, Easy fix. It's already got all the gravel there and everything. It's got to shape it and shape it, pave it, and stripe it, and it's good to go. <laughs> not Burlington supposed, not supposed to park there. Can't do it. It'll never happen, right? So. Hmm. Never mind. <laughs> <coughs> Any other thoughts on parking? I did a few scenarios to check it, and it looks like you did really did your homework. And uh, for the little exercise I did, it looks great. Makes sense. Good. I'm glad to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Very glad we did not do a. Uh, what was it like Anacortes did, where it was like between this and this, and it's like well. I'm sure there must be some reasoning there on when you can do one <laughs> versus the other. Sounds confusing, though. This, at least, you know, with a decimal, it may look a little confusing at first, but when it you have the language in there, you always round up. Then it removes any confusion. So, I know I tried, I tried to compare this to... I tried to compare this to my own residence. I live in a condo. We have there are two bedroom apartments, and we have two parking spots per unit. So if that raised to two point two five, we would we would not be encoded as as far as I what I read. Um, just a I, I, to me, just my initial reaction was, where are we going to buy for all this parking? Um, I think you get grand. I think you get your grandfathered. So. Yeah. So right. you're, what's that? Right. Yeah. Hopefully, we don't have to redo our, <laughs> our condo. I just. This is all for new, uh, new building. Concerned about. I mean, I, I realize the need for new parking and parking the issue at our co condo complex. I'm just concerned about real estate and how we're we going to provide all this parking. 
I don't have an answer. It's just where I, where's the bottom line that I'm trying to read this. Yeah, but um, as Commissioner Huggins was saying, any existing structures, they don't need to provide any more additional parking. Their current parking will just be grandfathered in. Right. On that note, though, would there be any triggers if there was like substantial remodeling or anything like that? We don't have any language that addresses that at this time. Uh, no, not yet. In the CBD, we do have that language for new construction only follows the those parking requirements, but that's about as close as we get to okay. a non-conforming parking situation. So the goal here is, could the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve? Is that what we're aiming for? Approve and adopt proposed amendments? Uh, not approve, but uh, just recommend any changes at this time. Okay. I'm anticipating one more session for review and then a public hearing, unless okay. you believe that public hearing is ready for next month. Oh. I'm under the impression it's not, though. No. Okay. This is... So tonight's just discussion. Okay. Um... On that first page, well, let's see, let me go to the second page. It says purpose, goal, goal T3, to benefit social well-being and economic development through street design. Can you anybody explain that to me? Yeah, um, I, so I included goal T3 because that is the overarching goal that policy T3.7 is embedded within. Um, I had just been reviewing previous memos and that was the standard that I had seen was the goal was outlined first and then if there were any subsequent policies those were outlined but um, mainly the main reason I or the main reason why I provided goal T3 was just to provide some context for policy T3.7. Okay. Anyone else? Commissioner Jasper, any no, sir, anything thank stand you. out at, at you there? Okay. Not at this time, thank you. Okay. Well, we can wrap this one up and move on to the next if uh, there's no objections. Do we have to have any? No motion. No motions, no nothing. Do you, <coughs> do you guys have enough notes on in, uh, input? Know where your direction is? Okay, good. Okay, if there's no further discussion, then we will close uh, part two of the unfinished business at 739 and move on to number three, proposed amendments to chapter 2.90 in Title 17 Cedar Willow Municipal Code to add regulations for cottage clusters. All right, so we're back again with cottage clusters. Um, so this, tonight I just wanted to frame this one as more of a discussion among each other. Um, with the main goals I'd like to achieve tonight is some direction on how we can simplify the code a little bit um, for both staff to utilize it in the future and for applicants who are looking to do these types of developments. Um, and then again, how can we incentivize um, the development of affordable cottage cluster housing? So um, back on September 9th, Ashton and I attended a North Star meeting. And what North Star is, is it's a, a public and private partnership that unites um, all the local governments within Skagit County jurisdiction. Um, it's tailored towards achieving 
um, solutions for homelessness and um, behavioral health issues um, and doing that under one overarching plan that each jurisdiction will follow in its own way but with goals and policies that are united. So um, we've been working on the housing crisis together. So um, the September 9th meeting that we went to um, was in person and we met with a number of developers throughout Skagit County. And the idea was just to share what each jurisdiction has been working on um, within their respective planning departments as far as housing goes, um, share that with the developers and get feedback from them. Are we on the right track? Um, are there any gaps that we need to fill? What aren't we thinking about? Um, and you know, is there ways that within reason we can shape these um, mechanics to better help you help us achieve these goals. So um, I did sh we did share with um, the folks at North Star, the developers there that uh, were working on the cottage cluster regulations. And a gentleman by the name of Kevin Moss um, did reach out to us. He's with Glacier Energy and a developer, I think based in Mount Vernon. And he has done cottage cluster development in Bellingham. And he shared with me Belling or Anacortes, I'm sorry, <laughs> Anacortes. Um, he he's done cottage cluster developments in Anacortes and shared with me their regulations. So I got a chance to look through those and I did attach them here. I found them very simple to follow. Um, there were some recommendations that I'd put in here that we should take a closer look at from Anacortes especially the density regulations. Um, they've got a number of easy to follow things on density, minimum, maximum number of cottages as opposed to trying to figure out your site size and doing all these random little calculations to figure out does it work to fit on site, have the developer work that out. <laughs> and, uh, um, then you can you can kind of set, you know, I think Anacortes, they have it at, you know, you have to have a minimum of three cottages and no more than 12. We can set those numbers to whatever we see fit, um, but that makes it very simple for us. Um, they have very specific setbacks and separation um, between buildings, similar to what we've got put in place, but I figured we could take a look at another example that is doing it right now. Maybe set up um, a field trip and go take a look at some of their examples that they've got in Anacortes right now. Um, I wanted to take a look at the shared community buildings definition. Um, so right now we have a clubhouse density bonus worked into the code. I wanna talk about that a little bit, but we don't have a definition put in place for a clubhouse, so what exactly does that mean? Um, could mean a lot of different things. And so uh, Anacortes has put together a pretty good definition of uh, their shared community building, which is essentially the same thing, but it kind of branches out from the typical idea of a clubhouse building. So, you know, a community kitchen or a workshop type space, a library, those sorts of things all would fall under the shared community building. So um, just to take a look at that, their private open space calculation is much simpler. I think they do 400 square feet of open space per unit. And so I like the way that they've written it as opposed to the way we have. It, ours is a little bit confusing with the ratio. And it's also, it, I don't think it scales up as well as Anacortes's does because when you do the 400 square feet per unit and ensures each unit's gonna have a good a buffer of landscaping and f have a feel of you've got your own um, yard space <laughs> that you can work with um, as opposed to being cramped in. So take a look at that. Access and parking is in there. And they've also specified that ADUs are not permitted um, ancillary to a cottage. So I think I think that would be smart. I recommend that we do the same. Um, if you know the concern is getting over dense, oh, over densification is of concern here, then I think it should be specified that ADUs are not permitted attached to a cottage. 
Um, other than that, so I wanted to I wanted to talk through those so we can take this one step at a time. I know there was a lot in the memo, so if we want to go through an accord as um, regulations, compare it with ours and see what changes we may want to make, we can start there. Um, I did also include in the memo a link to um, MRSC's page on affordable housing incentives. And I don't know if you guys got a chance to look through and peruse that, but it does have a number of different examples from other jurisdictions um, that have different strategies to address uh, incentivizing affordable housing outside of their density bonuses are included in that, but I wanted to kind of help us broaden the thinking there on what can we use aside from density bonus if density is not what we want here. So that's another point of discussion, but maybe we start with Anacortes's regulations and do some comparison. I was impressed with how simple it was. Mm -hmm. Like graphics that you added kind of helps to visualize the concept. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we went, started our aid, or, um, mm -hmm. cottage clusters, not ADUs, um, we were going from scratch. We didn't have anybody to plagiarize except for we did a field trip or two and that helped. But having this, you know, really helps. Yes. And I definitely think if, if we're trying to incentivize affordable housing, we don't need to go down the path of over-regulation. Mm -hmm. um, when you start getting into the specifics on the design has to be X, Y, and Z, and the lot size has to be this dimension, and here's your, you know, it's okay to put your setbacks and your landscaping and that sort of thing in, but when you get too into the weeds on things, the developer looks at this and they throw it out the window. They're like, nope, I don't wanna touch that. It's way too complicated. You start getting into uh, folks wanting to put some plans out in front of you, and staff are going through and redlining everything because your plan set doesn't work and then they've got to pay their architects and their designers to go back edit 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 until they can finally get an approved set so when you're thinking okay this is going to be an affordable housing project for me it's not so over regulation is not the answer so i like the idea of trying to simplify this um, I know we did take a look at um, in the design standards, and I apologize, those are not attached here, but we did look at um, using the design standards essentially copied from what the planned residential developments call for, high quality design. I'm hesitant on that, um, just given that we don't go so far to regulate our typical single family housing. So why? do it for these, it's essentially a smaller house. You know, that mm, the specifics in the planned residential development, uh, they're their own animal. So when you're trying to infill within existing neighborhoods, it almost makes it stand out more to me. I I'm not against any of these things. I always sound like, I always play the devil's advocate, so I, I end up sounding like the guy who's trying to just do everything the old way, and I'm not. But when you look at the history of planning and city building, all of the problems that cities have come from trying to pack too many people into too tight of spaces. You had people with rickets because they didn't have light. You had people who were sick because they didn't have sewage systems. You have, you know, so the more compact you make, the more, the more you pack humans in, the more it has to be planned. It has to be planned in a serious way. And my concern right now is the state of Washington is just saying, do ADUs, do this, let's pack the people in. But they're not, they're not, they're not providing a mechanism to do that properly and well. We, we are that mechanism. And they're expecting us to, uh, to take that and do that at the community level. 
And so, um, you know, you don't find a lot of problems with a farm out in the country. You can do any, you can build anything you want on a piece of property in the countryside, and you're probably you're not going to hurt anybody but yourself. You got plenty of parking. If it burns down, nobody else is going to burn down. All those things. You, you see my point. But but when you start packing people in tight, you've got to provide park space. You have to make sure that people's windows don't look into each other's houses. You have to do all of these things, and so there has to be a mechanism to do that. And if you leave it up to Developers, they aren't going to care because it's just about making a buck no matter what they say they're doing. And the people who do care are expensive. Engineers and architects cost money, okay? So, like I said, I'm not against these things. We just have to be real about this that, you know, when the state sets it up so that you can pack 18 houses onto, 18 houses onto an R5 zone, um, that's creating a nightmare scenario. It might not be a nightmare scenario, but you're creating, setting up a nightmare scenario if, if things don't uh, go well or you don't get people who plan well. So anyway, I, I, I want affordable housing. I want all these things, but there, we live in a, we live in a world here in Skagit County and all of Western Washington. We live in a finite space, okay? We have water on one side and we have public lands on the other side. We're in the same situation that places like San Francisco were in, where you know you just only have so much space. It's always going to be expensive to live here. It's just that that's how it is. If there's going to be affordable housing, it's going to be through charities. It's going to be through some form of charity that, that's going to get it done, and it's going to have to be um, done well. So I, I'm going to stop there. But but um, I think that the the denser you build, the more important it is that you have professionals involved in the process of doing it. And that's not because I studied architecture, it's just I've seen what engineers and architects can do versus what the average developer um, does. Not all of them, there's exceptions to everything. I'm, you know, I'm not a generalist, but, uh, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's what I see from, from my studies and my, my years doing things. So anyway, keep that, keep that in mind. We, we've, we've got a plan for stuff. I couldn't agree more. You said it very well. Thank you for saying that. I feel like sometimes we have a gun at our head, though, because they're saying you shall do this, even though we don't want to do this, but we will. But great point. We've got to be careful in what we're doing, doing it right. And um, I, I wrote in my notes, more dense, more expense. You know, we, we want things to be cheaper, but the more you pack them in, the more expensive it's going to get. And... Also, what you said about windows, I was part of a, a development up in Canada, and they packed thousands of houses in in a short period of time. They were building one to two houses per day for about six or seven years, trying to get everybody into Fort McMurray to, for the oil fields. And uh, they must have a heck of a good planning commission there because the houses all went in side by side by side by side, five feet apart, but no two windows were... It was like, okay, do that floor plan, but reverse it. Do that floor plan, you know. So, and then I remember one time somebody pointed out, they said, look, they, they messed up. They got those two windows facing each other. They can't be doing that kind of stuff. So it's like, wow, how'd they figure all that out? But it reminded me of that when Pat was talking, that we got we to gotta lay it out right. And I don't know. It, when you're packing people in, I remember when I was a kid, there was a, an experiment going on, and they said the... Uh, when you put too many mice in a packed situation, they start killing each other, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you look at the big cities, that's exactly what's going on. And I love your scenario. If you want something, you know, go out in the country and build what you want, but you gotta abolish the GMA to, to get our way. Um, anyway, I, won't, I was just trying to second what you were saying. Yeah. I wanted to add, I really appreciated your presentation at the housing forum. When I, so last meeting was my first uh, meeting and hearing about cottage clusters, I had a lot of concerns and I remember sending an email to you afterwards saying, how is it possible for a minimum wage one earner family who makes 30,000 a year to be able to afford something and seeing their slide that a $30,000 a year household should be able to afford a $148,000 house with 10% down, which doesn't take into account PMI or so many other expenses as well. Um, it just, I thought, how do you possibly build a house that's only 148,000? And I just don't see how it's possible, including land. Um, but I did appreciate your presentation. I love this idea. We know Kevin Moss 
I've walked through some of his, or one of his homes. It was just beautiful. And he thinks outside the box, which I really appreciate. I like to encourage, I like the idea of encouraging that. But I also agree that there has to be regulations. Um, there was a, a house he built. It was two, it was in an area that Mount Vernon required two parking, garage parking. And he placed the spots end to end instead of side by side in the house. And it was really fascinating how he put that together. Um, but I obviously have concerns about houses being built on top of each other <laughs> and safety. Uh, 400 square foot, my first apartment in college was 396 square foot, and that was tight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, um, I believe uh, you're talking about tandem parking, right? Yeah. So, so our code explicitly prohibits yeah. that. But... Um, Yes, there are a number of creative ways. Uh, Kevin has sh shared some of his floor plans and site plans with me. He, he's done a great job thinking outside the box, as you say. Um, yeah, I'd like to maybe reach out to him for a field trip. I actually mentioned this meeting to him, oh. but <laughs> <laughs> life gets busy. Yes. Nicole. Oh. Is that you? Yeah. Yeah. Commissioner Fredberg, you first. I, I was just going to say I don't want to hog the mic. So well, well if you're going down the, the line, yeah, you, I'll, wanna, I'll wait. Let's. I didn't have anything. I was just admitting that my, I ha, our, we have a house, the tandem garage, but maybe it's because it's 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 like a shop, basically. I don't know if it's in town. I'm, I'm pretty sure the people we bought it from had it, <laughs> had a permit, but maybe we should look into that. <laughs> maybe we bought it. It passed inspection. Strike that from the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious, did you get some feedback at that meeting, uh, or was it just kind of directing you, oh, maybe you should look at the Anacortis Code, or did you have anybody say, oh, this is overly complex, and this will be something that will be difficult to uh, for developers to get behind? So I didn't explicitly write it in my memo, but that list at the end, consider simplifying code, and the listed items there, those were the things that were brought up. So we should take a look at those okay. specifically. But other things in the in the code as well. Well, I, I may be jumping ahead a bit, but actually you kind of outlined the things that I thought were really great when I read through the, the Anacortis um, code. But um, definitely one that, that really stuck out to me. Uh, well, it didn't look to me like they... Uh, put any uh, minimum uh, lot area size. I mean, that was kind of the first thing there. And so they just totally just say, if you can fit it and meet all the other requirements, then that's really, that will lim that will be the limiting factor on how many units you can get. And it, it's very simple, but does the job. Essentially, yes, yeah. So they, they set the maximum number of cottages and they have set setback regulations and um, minimum spacing between the units as well as open space and private space requirements um, which are two separate things and um, yeah it essentially it has seemed to figure itself out and then of course the setbacks that was I felt like it was getting almost too <sighs> I don't know, like for a single family lot, it makes sense to have, you know, your front, side, rear, whatever. But when you're getting into a cluster, it makes sense to have the setbacks be for the entire mm -hmm. thing. And the separation is what controls how close they are to each other. And then also potentially that um, the required front porch that, that, that they had to may, I was reading through it fairly quickly, but, um, yeah, you can it, have some protrusions and yeah, the setback yeah, area. yeah, and it, it just it seemed like it it just naturally kind of policed itself in a way without having to get so bogged down in so many numbers. Mm Just curious, in the Anacortis code, do they allow 
the cottage clusters and all the different residential zones. They spell that out, they call them something different here. Not all of them, but I'm, I'm failing to remember which. There's, I think, says, two that it doesn't. It's 3A, 3, two, I don't know. We're going to have to know what their code means. Mm -hmm. Is it addressed in the density paragraph? Oh, I'm sorry, maybe not. Well, cause I did do a whole bunch of. One half. Yeah, it says that one half of a dwelling. Unit. Yeah, due to smaller relative size of cottage units, each cottage may be counted as one half of a dwelling unit for the purpose of calculating density. For example, a cluster of six cottages would be equivalent to three dwelling units. That's, uh, what page is this? I don't know, not numbered. So for the zoning question, I did make a note of that because I figured it might come up. So. And a court is allows cottage housing in all residential zones mm. except residential low density one, which is their R1, and Old Town, OT, mm. zones. Mm. Do we have an Old Town? That's our blue Central thing. Business District. Central Business District, okay. Mm -hmm. But we don't have like a historical district like Ferry Street or Talcott or... Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> uh, Culturally, so, yes, but not written. <laughs> right, yeah. So we, we do have a historic district. It's not officially codified through ordinance that that is what it is. It's not um, identified as such, really. But as a uh, spatial area, it is <laughs> as our historic downtown. So um, for certain design standards, certain things apply there and not in others. Um, certain uses apply there and are not permitted in others. For example, uh, within the historic downtown area, you have to have commercial ground floor in all cases when you're going to build um, mixed use. You can do residential above and behind, but you have to have commercial facing the f street frontage. Uh, outside of that area, however, you can do standalone multifamily up to four units. Huh. Um, so it, it's more of a kind spatial, of a yeah, thing. spatial thing. But um, and parking. <laughs> Thank you. If we could go through Anacorda's code mm -hmm. and pull out some things that you would like me to take a stab at changing within our code, that would be helpful to me. Well, I definitely want to see a similar setback. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Setback and separation, which is also on your list of <laughs> items that were suggested. Mm -hmm. As well as a definition for the um, clubhouse. Mm -hmm. I actually kind of like calling it something else besides clubhouse because to me, clubhouse. Um, maybe it's just my association sounds very ritzy mm -hmm. and um, like for a high-end um, community or something and, and the idea of cottage housing is supposed to be for all types, I, I feel like. And so, um, I don't know, it's just, it's just a word, but. Yeah, the, the community, something similar to that is actually not a bad idea, though we can define it differently than they did because it was a little interesting to me that it was so broadly defined that it could have be a library or, I mean, I guess that's shared community space, but... Uh, yeah. 
So in the memo, I did give an example. So, and we can smith this however we like, but I did say clubhouse means a shared community building which may include uses such as, but not limited to, a multi-purpose entertainment space, recreation center, community kitchen, library, workshop, or sim similar amenity that promotes shared use and a sense of community. This is very similar to Anna Corda's definition, but however we want to tailor that to be more fitting as you guys see fit, we can do that. One question I did want to ask is, for some reason, even though they disallowed ADUs in association with the cottages, they did allow one for the club, their community building, which, what's the thinking, a caretaker, is that why? That was my thought. I kind of had the same question, but I'm thinking with, with how specific they got and the types of things that would count as a shared community building, I'm like, Maybe they'd want to have someone there to oversee that space. A library, you know, I would probably want someone keeping track of where the books are going. Um, a workshop, maybe someone there for safety reasons, security. Who knows? <laughs> Speculation. Or even, even a guest, if you're having somebody in to do a presentation, and there'd be a place for them to stay uh, right. while they're doing their presentation or whatever, you know, without having to go out of the community and get a... Or something, yeah, maybe it's know. a theater space. Who knows? <laughs> Could be anything. I like that it's flexible. It just seems a bit odd to have an accessory dwelling unit to a non-residential mm -hmm. structure because my understanding has generally been that an accessory dwelling unit is accessory to a residential primary dwelling unit, not a commercial or some other use. And I tend to agree with that statement. Typically, I would see a accessories being, being ancillary to the use that is primary. So I wouldn't, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's yeah. kind of out of place, in my opinion. I can see so many uses for it, though. I mean, you could have it on a first come, first, or sign up basis that, you know, if you're having somebody visit, they could stay in that unit over the common or behind, or however you have it set up, behind the common space. And, uh, you know, it's just first, first come, first serve, or, um, or sign up. So maybe we don't call it an ADU. Maybe we call it something else. Yeah. That, that's like three, at least three uses we've come up with just mm -hmm. <laughs> here tonight. That uh, Caretakers, residences. Yeah, we, we can, can get creative with that. Why wouldn't you just have it as a cottage that's maybe oriented differently or something like mm -hmm. that? I, that would make more sense to me if we were to consider something like that. Mm -hmm. We had in our code that we wanted it to have an HOA, so maybe that ADU was a head of the HOA who's kind of running the mm -hmm. community. Think of it kind of as the main office for multifamily apartment complex type of thing, but they live there. <laughs> Something like that. Well, I very much liked your idea that um, there there are some things that you need to to um, regulate, but other things you know just seem like over the over the top. Um, and so, uh, like I. Like, I, I see why, if living in Washington, you expect that most houses would have a pitched roof, but you don't have to say exactly what the pitch is. I like that they've got a, in the city of Anacortes, they've got the um, uh, 6 and 12, the 12 and 6, or whatever it's called, uh, roof pitches. That's actually in the height limits, but anyway, um, you know, it, it's, 
I agree that we shouldn't be telling them that we, whether you use clapboards or whether you use T111 siding on the side of the house. I mean, that's stuff you should leave to the designer of the of the facility that wants to, you know, put in the, the cottage cluster. So anyway, I, I like that that it, that, you, they might lo that we might loosen those kind of restrictions and let designers do what designers do. Does Anacortis allow for the park models? Is it fixed? Fixed in place? Or were they all framed in? I don't recall that ever being specified. Assuming, yes, if it's not specifically prohibited to use them, prohibited didn't, to use them. Didn't it address 400 square foot minimum yeah. for the open area? And that would be the park model size, right? If I recall. Correct, yes. And I take it they didn't have separate design standards to go along with this. This is it? Yeah, this, this is it, yes. They make it simple by just saying support compatibility with existing neighborhoods by promoting high quality design. That could be anything mm -hmm. that looks good. And number five, enhance the character of the residential neighborhood. That's pretty, kind of leaves it wide open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make, make it look good. They do have some stuff on, uh, let's see, it's their number eight facade transparency. Transparent windows and or doors are required on at least 8% of facades featuring the primary entrance and facing streets and common open spaces. For corner lots, the standard is only applied to the elevation containing the primary entrance. Mm -hmm. So there still are some, some things that yep. do set expectations for high quality appearance. Mm -hmm. And I like the... Uh, I think they have a provision for attached garages in here. This may be a bit of a difficult question to answer, but how how difficult is it to, when a code is written to be this open and subjective when it comes to the kind of the couple of things that were just read there, um, because then that puts it on the planning staff to kind of define and make a decision and that in that regard being a little bit more specific would seem to make it a little bit easier for everybody i mean what what are your thoughts as ha being on that side of things and having to actually put the code into practice mm. um it honestly depends on what it is. When it comes to design, I tend to be more lenient with people because I like people having, and this is just my personal method of doing things, but I like people having a little bit more creative flexibility on what they want to put up for their windows and what they want to put up for their shingles. You know, it's like, um, I know it's come up a few times within PRDs where our developers run into budgeting issues where they didn't see something coming with the utilities needing to be reworked and so they spent extra money on that and now they don't have quite enough to purchase their additional siding materials that are required in our PRD design standards. So what can we do to meet the intent of the design code here? You know, can we maybe enhance the landscaping a little bit more and put up um, like decorative lighting or something like that as opposed to the siding that we did get approved but we can't afford it. <laughs> so it, there are areas where we can take some discretion and think through what is the intent of what we're trying to achieve. Um, so I think a very clear intent statement is helpful there um, and then adding in language that uh, 
certain things are according to director's approval uh, on a case-by-case -case basis if, if there are areas where it's kind of open to interpretation. Um, too many of those areas can lead to problems though because uh, then you, you do have issues with, okay, you let this person do this, and I have a similar suggestion and you're not letting me do this where it's the consistency. You do run into issues there. So it's a fine line that you have to ride with that sort of thing. I, I agree. Uh, it, it, it seems in the past that's been an issue. I know John was always about nailing everything down because um, because he didn't like having to negotiate. But you, that's the, you're comfortable with that, so it, it works for you. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's um, one of those things because you can't let the developer balance his books on the standards that affect other people in surrounding neighborhoods and in the neighborhood itself. So, so it does become a... <laughs> it can become a bone of contention. I tend to look at every every case kind of in its own light. You know, if if the person is dealing with a very tight timeline, their permit's going to expire in two weeks, and we don't have time for them to wait to you know make up more money to do this later. And then I'm like, okay, maybe let's look at some some options to get you to where you need to be. Yeah. I try to be a good you know ethics ethical person. Yeah. <laughs> so. So then is the onus on them to demonstrate um, why they're, like in, in a case where the code is kind of vague like this, mm. it's to convince you that it meets that vague definition then, and they're saying, well, because we've done A, B, and C, we can maybe cheap out on D kind of thing a little bit, you know. I always leave the convincing to the to the applicant, yes. It's not my job to tell them why I think they are close yeah. enough to the code. <laughs> so um, they have to they have to give a good uh, reasoning. And um, yeah, it, it, again, it's a, it's a fine line to ride, but um, always look at the intent. Mm Yeah, it's, it's never going to be a perfect system. Um, you know, you have people that over-design everything, and uh, you could you could you could have nothing, and they would come up with awesome designs, and you could have you could have everything nail absolutely nailed down, and there would be still somebody who will wiggle through without doing you know half of what they're re required to do. It's just the nature of the beast, and <laughs> so I I, I think um, as someone who has done design, I. I like the idea that things are not totally free for all, but but that they're you're kind of in the middle where there is room to to be creative and and show new ideas, but um, but also agree that it's always on the person who's presenting the idea to explain why this is a great idea or why this should be done or whatever. So. so. <coughs> I'm curious about this attached duplexes idea was that something that you guys were interested in as well because it really changes that circle space around each dwelling it does um, Let me find it first, sorry. <laughs> I just lost it, I'm sorry, I was just right there. Yes. Attached duplex cottages are allowed in the R3, R3A, R4, and R4A zones. Um, yeah, essentially, as long as they don't go over their maximum number of cottages. I suppose that could be useful if you're working, say, within a higher density zone, R7, where you've got duplexes, and um, R15, where you've got anything. you got range from a single family duplex all the way to multifamily apartment complexes. When you'd start putting units together like that, it might mesh a little bit 
more well with the existing structures in the zone. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm kind of thinking that basically we use the PRD kind of guidelines as a starting point for our um, cottage cluster um, because we didn't have an example. Now we have something like this and it's possible that we could kind of build the design things we want to see into this and potentially not have separate design standards. Was that kind of what you were that's my hope, yes. Uh, I like, as we were talking before with the parking standards, I like seeing everything all in one place and not having separate things referencing each other. Um, I see this Anacorta's example is very similar to how our ADU chapter is laid out where it's just everything listed out. It's very easy to follow and I don't have to siphon through three different sets of regulations really to figure out what applies. Um, so yes, that's my hope is to kind of use Anacorta's code as uh, maybe our new backdrop and try to wiggle in what we've worked on so far just with the mindset of trying to simplify it more um, like how this one is laid out. And I think we can get there. I, I think, yeah, that's there's no reason to have it in two spots. Mm -hmm. We have two classifications, tiny homes and cottages. Did they deal with anything like that? They didn't make specifications. So my assumption, and I might check with Anacortes on this, um, but my assumption is that cottages is kind of an overarching thing. So it would include your park models. It would include your tiny homes. Maybe they have a separate definition laying around somewhere that I wasn't able to track down. So I'll ask them about that. Okay. Um, <coughs> but given that they didn't specifically prohibit any one or the other, I'm thinking mm -hmm. that they do allow them. I can't find it right now, but it seems their their front setback was much less than ours. I think we had like 25 feet or something, and there's a... I think we're 20, 20, but we should be 25 because you have to walk around, you have to walk around the tailgates of the big construction trucks and you're where they're parked in front of their garages. No, you're right about that, but I think they said you can't have parking in front of the cottage. I'm looking at this page. What is the page number? Minimum setbacks from table 19.42.020 has um, setbacks from the street, setbacks from the garage, side street setbacks. Yeah, so, so our current front setback to any public street or internal access drive is 20 feet. And theirs is much less, I think 10. Well, what I'm looking at, so maybe I'm looking at the wrong one. I, I'm looking at, I, I know it's Anacortes because it's got the yellow highlights, but it says, um, Street setback, garage minimum, and it says 25 feet for R1, and then everything else is 20 except for um, Old Town. Hmm. But I went out and measured one over on on um, Sock Mountain because to find out that they were 20 feet because because <laughs> I have to constantly go out into the street to go around the back ends of the um, mm -hmm. of the big construction trucks, you know. Okay. I'm on just after that overhead photo of the cottages. Underneath that it says C standards, lot sizes. 
And then four, setbacks and separation. The minimum setback set forth in table 19.42. Yeah, it's uh, page 12 of 40, which only yeah. comes up when you're moving the screen. Okay. I apologize if the materials are kind of hard to navigate. They had so many different, click this link to the separate code thing. Yeah. So I tried to include a reference page to help guide you to those different things. So ta the table you're looking for is in the references page toward oh, the end. okay, I oh. found it. Street setback minimum, okay, oh. RS, R3A I should say is a setback of 10, and R4 setback of 10 from the street. Side street, from a side street. Oh. Yeah, it's 20, and then, oh, I see R3. Oh, you're asking why is that one 10? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, excellent, yeah, good question. I guess we don't know what an R3A or R4 is. Um, so R3A is the residential medium density. Um, R3, without the A is the same thing. Um, and is that a true, is that a true density? I mean, like RR5 is no longer really an R5. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, I mean, they're, they're talking about medium density. Is that before or after they add on the possible ability of ADUs and uh, I'll have to poke around with that because I think their their numbering system is different than than our you know, five units per acre. Oh, so I was getting saying. excited because if, if it's clear, I want I want to jump to their system if if it's, <laughs> more, if it's more if it's more true than our um, zoning system is now. So. Well, yeah. s somewhere it said a cottage will count as half a house on a lot, so yeah. that would be ten in a R five instead of eighteen. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so you might like that part. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't care. I don't care what the density is, as long as the zoning actually expresses what the thing is. I don't want to. I don't want everybody to think they live in an R5 when they live in an R18. Mm -hmm. That's what I. Um, that, that's what I want. I want it to be consistent, so people actually know what they're getting. There is a s bit of consistency here. If you have a house on a lot, you can have an ADU. So there's two. Or you can have two cottages on that same lot. So. Kind of the same thing. And, and the, re the reason I bring that up about the zoning is that is that um, for since I've been on the planning commission, when you looked at a zone, you knew what the density was, mm -hmm. you know, it w and you were advertising exactly what was going to get built there. But now it doesn't do that, and so um, we need to come up with a new way of. Doing it so that um, so that what we're advertising is what people are getting when they <laughs> when they move into the neighborhood, right? You think you're moving into a, where it's going to be this dense, and you find out later that it's actually three times denser because of two ADUs and the and the thing, and that's kind of false advertising from my my point of view. So I'd like to get back to to. Uh, are you thinking something like more generic? titling for the zoning. So like kind of how, how they have this, their um, residential medium density. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our seven zone might turn into something like that, medium density. That would be okay, as long as we define what, what that is, what, what mm -hmm. the medium density entails. And it looks, it looks like they do in theirs, so. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that's a separate topic than this. Yeah, so. right, zoning is different. <laughs> I did want to point out, I thought it was interesting in their minimum setbacks table. They have an interior side setback for upper floors, so that's meaning the distance, I believe, between if you have a second story 
how how close together your second story can be from the second story of another building. Yeah. I totally get that. It's for, that's fire, right? And yeah. uh, and and they used to do that in uh, in New England in the old days, and in and in your all over Europe, right? You had the you had the you had the se uh, separation at street level, and then you had and then or between the houses, and then on the second floor they would bump them out with a little little cantilever, right, <laughs> and uh, all the way around the house. That's why how you, so they go up and then they go out and then they go up again. So yeah, they're saying it got me thinking about our our setbacks. We don't specify that. Yeah, not in our code. Oh, we have five five feet. It's the fire code it says that uh, that you have to have five between your house and the property line. So that makes a ten foot buffer between between houses. Yeah, we say five feet on each side, and they say ten feet, ten feet between dwellings. Mm -hmm. It's basically the same thing. Yeah, it's just in our yeah. fire code. <laughs> you have to do the jump. <laughs> Not my department. <laughs> <laughs> well, being the clock watcher that I am, I'm just reminding everyone it's after eight thirty. Okay. So. Uh, we can keep going or we can uh, decide to table it till next month and do our do some more research and come up with questions and answers. Okay. Yeah, I've I've got some some good feedback. I'm gonna take a stab at a shared community building if we wanna go with that name or something else. Community center, community, community they have it written Hall, here. Yeah, that's good. Community, shared community building. Yeah. The SCB. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I'll, I'll take a stab at creating something for us there, um, see how we like it. And um, I'm going to try to rework this. Um, kind of, it'll be kind of a big rewrite, but to streamline it to be more like an Accordus code. Um, I'm gonna get rid of the design standards and guidelines chapter and work it into this. So it's all in one place. Um, and and what, what's the timeline on this one? Uh, are, are we gonna bring this back a couple more times or would you like everything back next time ideas or? That's a good question. It depends on how much more discussion we, we <laughs> take on. Yeah. Um, so I do, I do want to go in depth into the incentive stuff. I think um, the affordable housing thing is complex, and we do need to talk that through. Um, so I will ask that you all take a real good deep dive into the link I've provided to MRSC, because that has all sorts of uh, different examples from jurisdictions that have tried a number of different strategies. Um, and just seeing what we think would work best for our cottage housing um, as incentive to incentivize affordable housing. Because um, what I was hearing from you guys from the past was density is not the way to go. We should find another way to do this because as we were talking about before, if we don't incentivize, how can we make sure these are going to be truly affordable over time? Can I float an idea before we quit for the night? Yes. Um, we've talked about various ways to make things affordable in the housing market, and something came to my mind today, and it could be totally n undoable, but I don't know how to bring this up. Okay, the community of Shelter Bay, the people there own the ho their houses, but they don't own the land. They lease it. So would it be an incentive for builders, rather than a builder to have to buy the land, they could build the houses and the landowner leases it to the people living there? So the people aren't buying the land and the house, they're just buying the house. It's very similar to how a mobile home park is set up. I just wanted to float it for that to go through people's noggins because a land owner would be more freely, he would give up his land freer if, well, that's the wrong word, he would be happy to give up his land if he could maintain that land as his own or her own, the person's own. And uh, the builder's happy because he doesn't have to buy it. 
the people living in the houses are happy because they don't have to buy the land and the house, but they have a house that's 60% of what the cost of a house would be. But I don't know if there's a mechanism for that. I guess it would be a community owned or a personally owned land. Yeah, it kind of sounds like a land trust. <clears throat> they, they actually do that. They actually do that in Europe. I've, I've been watching some things, and they actually do that in Europe. It's a really, really old thing, but you can have, you can own a piece of property, and you can own all the buildings on the property, or you can own the land, and you can own a building on the on your on the on your land. But you could have another one that you just sell the footprint of the house to the person, so they don't have to buy all the land. They just have to buy the footprint that their house sits on, and you don't own that. Um, and so you have. The reason I, I heard about it was because people got in these situations where they went to, to Europe and bought property and they thought they were buying the houses too and found out that they were buying the property and maybe some of the buildings, <laughs> but for some buildings on the property did not belong to them. And they go, start, you know, we're like, hey, you got to get out so I can remodel the house. And it's like, no, we own the house. <laughs> you, you bought the land and the, and the building. So anyway, um, it can be confusing, but it's, uh, it's an interesting idea and probably created for the same, same reason you're talking about. Interesting idea, but just something to dwell about. What was the example you shared? You Shelter, Bay Shelter Bay in La Conner that is called leased land. There's two lands. There's Fee Simple, where you own the land and the whatever's on it and the sky above it. Or you can be in a leased land where you pay an HOA and you can own the house, but you can't own the land. Mm. And you can sell that house but you just can't sell the land. And what happens is you, you, the houses in Shelter Bay are much cheap, not much, but they are cheaper than the normal house mm -hmm. for that reason. I think they belong to the tribe. I think yeah, Shelter Bay belongs to the tribe. It does, but I, I don't think. Yeah, it's totally that's the same year, way. Yeah, 100 year lease. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So they're not giving up their land, but they're letting mm -hmm. people use it. So. But why can't that be standard in a city? Not everywhere, but a certain amount of the city could be leased land by private owners mm. or corporations. Definitely worth corporations looking into. Corporations are in the equity on the land and not the people who are living in the house. <laughs> and another bonus would be they could have the HOA, you could have caretakers so the people don't have to maintain their yards if they don't want to be more of a condominium type of thing, but they have a house. Mm -hmm. So elderly, young people, they're working all the time. They don't have to come on and mow their lawn. It's already done for them. Mm -hmm. to think about. And you're not paying property taxes on the land, just the house. You know, that too, and as a bonus, the person leasing the land, if he didn't or she didn't have to pay property taxes or got lowered ones because they're helping the community, then they're really going to want to give up their land to start building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Okay. Incentives, just different incentives. Yeah. Good discussion. Thank you. I've got some homework to do. Um, Anyone in favor of tabling or more to say? Oh, just one final thing, and I'm sure you were already looking at this, um, and you're going to be doing a lot of re reworking, but just if there's any way to simplify the open space stuff. Um, I know we were trying to work in maybe some density bon or something, or maybe I'm off there, but yeah, it's just, it feels very overly complex, so. I'm on it. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have better direction than that. But. Commissioner DeVoyne, anything before we table this? Uh, I guess this a question. What is it that I'm trying to figure out the cemetery and then just trying to figure out what is it any going to get to the public hearing? I mean, I'm trying to figure out what I need to do to satisfy my role in this. Um, by the next meeting, there'll be another burden for us to review, to, to review correct? Yeah, so at this time, we're talking through just discussing this very preliminary draft of things. Mm -hmm. I like to get this as close as possible to something that we feel is ready to present to the council for approval 
before we move to a public hearing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're not there yet. <laughs> so, so we're gonna rework this. And uh, you know, the more research that gets done behind the scenes by the planning commissioners, um, and the more you review my stuff, um, just with a fine tooth comb, find anything that you feel like doesn't work or needs fine tuning or needs a definition, anything like that do is we, helpful to me. Do we need to raise them at me or should we write them down and send them to you? That's, uh, that's all things you should discuss here with the planning commissioners at this, at this meeting yeah. during the discussion period. Yeah. So when I send you the meeting materials, on Fridays, take those, make notes, so that you know what you might wanna bring up for your discussion at the following planning commission meeting. Great. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm just trying to go what, what, when you answer the question, where are we going with this? So, I know it's a simple question, but you answered it. Thank you. Yes. And then just uh, a note that the MRSC link didn't seem to be working for me in the, oh. and since I was on my iPad, I didn't have a chance to go type it in. I'll do that on my computer, but uh, I don't know if anybody else had any problem. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try sending it to um, the general email too. Maybe it was just an issue having it I think it just wasn't it hyperlinked, and so, oh, and okay. I think him to get the image. Okay. I'll and try if, another and if that still doesn't work, you Copy. could try just go to the MRSC website and kind of follow the the yeah. subject matter here. To, yeah. Once I'm on my laptop, it'll be. If nothing else, I can just type it in. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Copy yeah. and paste the URL. Mm -hmm. Anything else before I close unfinished business? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, We'll go ahead and uh, do our homework on uh, the proposed amendments and come up with more questions and answers next month on cottage clusters. And that's uh, close of unfinished business 842, new business. Yes. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Glover. Okay. Uh, we are continuing on with our comp plan uh, update process. We are ready to meet with you to talk about uh, the vision statement for the comp plan. And talking with our consultant team today, uh, what we'd like to do is, is devote um, all or at least most of one of your sessions to this matter. Um, and you're looking at dates and going ahead. Um, we're looking at the December meeting to do this. That date would be December 17th, which is uh, the third uh, Tuesday of the month. If by then we're rolling along and it looks like we have a full agenda for other stuff, we could have another meeting on December 10th, which is the Tuesday before. Um, hopefully we don't have to have two meetings in one month and hopefully we can do it all in one meeting. But anyway, I wanted to offer those two dates for you if either of those work. Uh, the other reason I'm offering an earlier date is I know that as we get on into December, we start preparing for holidays and, and we get, you know, people go on vacations or whatever. And um, so I wanted to ask you guys tonight uh, f if you would like for me to uh, set December 10th or December 17th for this work, this work session on vision statement. Either one for me. Uh, either one. They're both Tuesday nights. Yes, they are, yeah. I know I want to log the real planning committee. We meet on the second Tuesday. So I would have a conference for December 10th. Okay. Uh, I could go in at one, or, one or the other, but not both. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, sure. Okay. Um, well, if you're... If you if you're not leaving town <laughs> on December seventeenth, we could stick with that regular third Tuesday of our. I'm in I'm in the school, so I'll be here till the twenty second, I think, or something. So. Okay. Okay. Then we'll aim for December seventeenth. And what we're looking at doing is having uh, what they call a charrette, and we might set it up where we have uh, the round table mm -hmm. format and some paper in front of you, and they present. Um, 
some of the ideas and feedback that we got from the surveys and then help us uh, walk through the process of coming up with a vision statement. It could take some time, and, and but that's okay, and we wanna make sure that you guys all have an opportunity to weigh in on that. This would be open to the public too, because um, it's a public meeting. But um, we really struggle with having a whole separate <laughs> charrette available to the entire community and I think to do that, you'd have to pick a Saturday and just plan on eight hours. I think that's probably ugh, asking it a whole lot. So we'd like to try this um, a couple hours at a planning commission meeting on, on the 17th. I keep going. We're going to bring this stuff back and do a, and do a charrette on the... I'm sorry? We're going to bring back the... Uh, the, the um, Consultants. The military. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do the charrette. The, the, oh, I'm sorry, the cluster... The, Okay, so that will be on the, on the meeting on the 23rd, or uh, in November. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what date? 19th, isn't it? Okay, so we're just doing the charrette on the 17th. Yes. That's the whole purpose. That's, that's okay. what I would prefer, yeah. Right, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Would that be considered a regular meeting then, or um, it, yeah? It, yeah, uh, it would be a regular meeting. We could also call it a, a workshop, but it would, it would be, f okay. for legalese, it would be a meeting. Do we okay. need to do any special notice noticing of this? I'll just check being on a little that. bit different. I don't know. I'll check on that because I I know in my past uh, uh, jobs we would notice a public workshop is what we call it versus a public meeting. But uh, there by now there might not be that difference. Mm -hmm. I'll talk with Nikki. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody have anything? New business. Um, did everyone have a chance to see the video that was the YouTube video that you sent the link to? That was pretty good. Oh, for the, the for the city. Yeah, that was a that was a video that uh, Charlie and, and the mayor uh, worked on with a production company. Um, it was pretty cool. I want to thank our actors yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we want uh, autographs. I know. Did you see Nicole on the skateboard and, yeah, and, yeah. and Ashton on the bike along with uh, Julie, <laughs> who's also in our department? Yeah, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? Um, and then uh, the video was presented at the um, annual conference of ICMA, which is the International City County Managers Association, uh, I think it was in Pittsburgh. Uh, along with a bunch of other cities that had done the same thing. So we were right in there with it with some other cities. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. yeah. Good job. So, anyone? 848, we're done with uh, new business. Any, uh, one want to make a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Commissioner Sexton makes a motion to adjourn at 848. Do I have a second? Commissioner Devoin, second it. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 I was, I was supposed to ask if there's any further comment. Okay. <laughs> Too late, Nico. Too late. <laughs> We're adjourned at 848. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.